Uh, I'm Fred Swanson with Gay City Health Project, and uh, this is the magic pill. Fred, what is Fred? Such a complex issue. Well, uh, Prep is an interesting, uh, interesting program. I don't know a lot about it. Prep. I think it's always good when we get new tools to use in our fight against HIV. So the topic of PrEP is a pretty fascinating, um, exciting, and emotionally charged topic. Um, so PrEP would mean that I'm HIV negative, but I could take HIV medication that might help me stay HIV negative. For me personally, I've been HIV positive for six years now, and um, and it's kind of interesting that now there's, you know, might be a, a pill that might prevent the transmission of HIV. Um, and if I could have gone back six years ago, and if I would have known what I know today about the pill, I might have, you know, made the choice to take the pill. Um, I can remember back in the 80s, uh, it was basically stain or die. Uh, you know, uh, being at risk of AIDS, and not, not saying that PrEP possibly is a cure-all, but but the fact that it's available and to uh, anybody that could be exposed to the HIV virus, to me, is a, a breakthrough. And uh, and if it had been around 20 years ago, I think uh, things would have even been better. It is really truly an additional tool on top of all these 30 years of prevention and education for HIV. Or is it really, you know, some kind of power being pulled here about um, pushing uh, a specific medical agenda? My biggest concern is that there are plenty of HIV positive individuals in this country who need the meds and don't have the money. It might be viewed differently for gay men in the general community, that it might be viewed in other populations of color. Uh, particular, um, I think in the Latino community it might mean um, further questions, further concerns. Um. You know, as a gay white man, I've never had a, a problem having access to health care. Um, my main concern is for, uh, you know, marginalized portions of our community having access to the actual medication as HIV positive individuals. Aside from the socio-political issues that the data from IPEX result have unearthed, um, it has been a meaningful conversation to have with all communities of how this can impact their community. So I think it goes without saying that for the community of gay bisexual men, how are we going to harness this information that will benefit the health of this community and also maybe teach other communities of how they can utilize this. I think what's more important about the pill itself is that we as individuals and as a community address what it means to protect our health and wellness. Yo creo que la cuestión de PrEP es una cuestión muy eh, controversial, es, eh, tiene mucho de qué hablar, mucho de qué decir. Hay, la opinión es muy variada en muchas comunidades, tal vez lo que la, el PrEP signifique para la comunidad latina no es lo mismo que signifique para la comunidad blanca o para otras comunidades de color. Quién va a pagar, quién tiene acceso, eh, cómo se lo va a hacer, ¿Es, es bueno o no. Todo ese tipo de preguntas eh, eh, son muy importantes y, y, y a veces es muy difícil poder tener una, una, una oportunidad de, de, de hacer preguntas a las personas que han, estuvieron involucradas en el estudio. Por eso es muy importante que, que, que tengan. I think that folks should definitely investigate all the facts and find out what the pros and cons are for themselves and not let themselves be too swayed by anyone besides themselves. Uh, there's plenty of stuff online, there's plenty of opinions, but I think it's really important that people think about the specifics such as, is this tool needed for them individually compared to other tools they have available? Uh, what are the ramifications of taking you know, this pill for themselves from a physical standpoint, so on and so forth. But I think it's a very personal choice that, you know, people should think about intensely on their own. The forum that we're here for today it is a really great opportunity to get further clarification. Drug counselor by day, drag diva by night, 
Alexa Manila is a social activist, community fundraiser, and all-around entertainer. She uses the magic of makeup to deliver serious subjects that sometimes surprise us with stage fright. She's proud to join everyone at tonight's event. There she is. Oh my God, I was cracking up backstage. I didn't know what was going on, I was in the dark. But I wanna, do, I wanna return a favor and let you know who Tony Buff is, if you already don't know him, in the big screen or maybe on your laptops or iPads. Tony is a well-known local and international activist, educator, and performance artist in the BDSM community. You'll have to uh, tell me what that means later. Director of Fetish Production for Falcon and Raging Stallion Studios, the world's largest producer of gay male erotica, my good friend, Mr. Tony Buff. Thank you, my dear. Speaking of erotica, watching that video at the opening of the show was kind of like streaming internet porn, huh? <laughs> well, you're probably wondering what's a leather man and a drag queen doing here tonight, huh? Yeah, totally, good times. Well, tonight we're doing Magic Pill. Now, you, how many of you have actually been at Gay Studies forums over the years? Show of hands. Oh, Very a lot good. of people. A lot of people. I don't know about you guys, but I've missed these forums. These are once-in-a-lifetime events that just really tickle your minds and really allow you to open your hearts, and hopefully tonight we can do that again. And I'm definitely glad that we're doing this again. I understand that it's been over seven years since we've done a community forum like this. That's right, and we're itching tonight. And are we going to scratch it tonight? <laughs> good, 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 good. So, and, and what a topic. A magic exactly. pill. I mean, could you imagine? I, I, I used to dream of an AIDS vaccine or a magic pill that you could take way back in the 80s. Yes, I'm that old. Is this really the magic pill? Well, there's a lot of information that we're going to be exploring this evening so that all of us can make an informed decision and, and uh, understand what it is we're talking about. So let's talk a little bit about the purpose of today's forum. That's wonderful. All right. So tonight we're going to be learning about the pre-exposure prophylaxis that we now know as PrEP, P-R-E-P. PrEP is a new topic for many people in our community, so tonight's designed to be informative. But tonight is also designed to provide a space where we can openly discuss the issues surrounding PrEP, its potential uses, and limitations as a prevention tool. PrEP is a large topic that includes different types of medications and affects many populations. We'll touch on those different aspects of PrEP, but we will be focusing on gay and bi men specifically. I don't know about you guys, but how truly far would you go to stay HIV negative? I'm a drag queen, duh, big surprise, right? If I already have to worry about matching my belt with my shoes and then have to worry about this, oh God, that's a disaster. It's like I would be lip syncing for my life. So hopefully tonight I can get garner some uh, feedback from you guys and maybe help me figure some stuff out. So our overview for the evening, we have three presenters and four community panelists with us tonight. And we want to take this opportunity right now to, of course, uh, on behalf of Gay City, who is our proud presenter of tonight's forum, and thanks for our su uh, support from a the HIV Vaccine Trials Unit and Seattle Gay News. Special thanks to the Public Health Seattle and King County for providing ASL interpretation. Did you say ASL or ESL? ASL. Good, I may need one for ESL. Just saying. <laughs> now, we have some guidelines for our, our forum and our discussion this evening. PrEP can be a very controversial topic, so just a few things to keep in mind about being civilized and respectful of your neighbors tonight. And it's okay to disagree. So agree to disagree. You're invited to share your opinions because everyone's voice matters. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker this evening. Let's start off by learning more about what exactly PrEP is and the scientific research behind it. Here to tell us more is Dr. Jared Beaton. Correct, Beaton? Beaton. 
Dr. Baton is an assistant professor at the Departments of Global Health, here we go, and medicine, and the adjunct assistant professor at the Department of Epidemiology at the University of Washington. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. I have the most boring outfit on the stage, but it's, I'm not trying to look professorial. This is how I always dress. Um, so I'm here to provide the facts. What is PrEP? And I, you know, we have the introduction and the, um, the talking heads explained it for us, but I wanted to give this some context because you've probably heard of PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, and how does that differ from what PrEP is? Let's say you, at this time, or someone you know, has an exposure to HIV that you intended or you didn't intend um, when you started your evening. And there's a chance with every exposure of HIV that someone can get infected. When we use PEP, or post-exposure prophylaxis, someone who's been exposed or think they've been exposed to HIV takes medicine starting after the exposure to try to prevent the virus from taking hold in their body and tries to block that infection from happening. In contrast, PrEP extends that back to before the exposure actually happens and blankets that period, potentially reducing the risk even more. There are people who may have exposures to HIV more than once over and over again sometimes. And one course of PEP has its limitations because it only may cover just that one exposure. And there are lots of other challenges of PEP, starting it up on time, recognizing that the exposure that, had, that one had might have been at risk for HIV, and finishing meds um, with a more complex PEP regimen. PrEP would blanket a period when someone has repeated exposures to try to keep them negative and uninfected with HIV. Right now, there are two medicines, two HIV medicines that we use for treatment all the time, including in my clinic this afternoon, for people who are infected with HIV, and those are being used for PrEP. Two of them. One's called tenofovir by itself, and one is a co-formulation, two drugs in the same pill, of tenofovir and another medicine called emtricitabine, it's sold under the name Truvada. I tend not to talk in brand names because I don't work for any brand company and I don't get any money from any brand company, but I'll call it Truvada because that's how probably most people have heard about it. Truvada is what's been tested for gay and bisexual men. But PrEP is a big deal because it's being tested in lots of places. As of right now, there are completed or ongoing studies in more than 11 countries and on the way to 20,000 people being involved in HIV research using PrEP and all over the world, Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and the United States. Women, men, lots of different populations. Reflecting a lot of enthusiasm for this, and indeed there are many more people involved in these trials right now than there are in a vaccine trial, sadly. So what is IPREX? You've probably heard about IPREX. IPREX was a clinical trial to test if PrEP prevented HIV infection. It had almost 2,500 gay and bisexual men and transgender women who took either PrEP every day or took a placebo pill every day. They did that because we didn't know if PrEP would work. They're enrolled at 11 places in six different countries in North and South America, Thailand, and really interesting for me, it worked, because I work a lot in Africa and South Africa, the first clinical trial of gay men to be done in Africa. 70% of the participants were from Peru or Ecuador, 10% were from the US, San Francisco and Boston. Half the men were less than 25, that an average of 18 partners in the three months prior to, get, to entering into the study suggesting they had, an, they had ongoing potential for having HIV risk. And 60% had unprotected recepto, receptive anal sex in the prior three months. So potential for real HIV exposure. And this was published in a 
peer-reviewed medical journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, at the end of last year. So at the end of this study, 2,500 men entered, 100 of them got HIV after the study started. 64 who took a placebo, and 36 who took PrEP. For, in the statistics when it calculates out, a 44% reduction in, get, in the risk of getting HIV. Wasn't perfect, but it took their risk from, it took their risk from higher to lower. And that's what we do with HIV prevention strategies, try to th find things that bring that risk down. And by putting several things together, bring it down even more. Time called this one of the top 10 medical breakthroughs of 2010. But it's not perfect. We heard a lot of the, in the introduction, there's a lot of things that might make PrEP work or not work, or work for some people and not others. In IPREX, PrEP was safe. The men who took Truvada had a similar frequency of serious medical complications as the men who took placebo. So it didn't cause bad things in, in the men. There were some side effects. More nausea, especially in the first month. And people who've talked, people who know people, who have talked to people, who, know, who themselves have taken HIV medicines before, or any medicines really, know sometimes it takes some time to get used to it. So there was more nausea in the first month. And in men who got HIV, who were on PrEP, there were no cases of HIV resistance. But there were three cases of HIV resistance of men who started the trial when they were already infected. They were in the window period. One of them got resistant virus from somebody else. They got it transmitted to them. And we know this happens. It happens in Seattle. Two of them might have gotten resistant virus because their virus that they got became resistant because they took a month of PrEP. It's really important to think about how to roll out PrEP in a way to not give it to people who are already infected. Adherence, or taking the pill every day, was key for PrEP in IPREX to have protection. Men who took more than 90% of their pills were 73% protected against HIV. But men who took less than that were only 20% protected. And that 20% probably isn't all that different from zero. So what, and really what was interesting is that when they went back and they tested some of the guys who got HIV and some of the guys who didn't get HIV, they found that eight per, only 8% 8 of the guys who got HIV had PrEP in their bloodstream at the time that they were diagnosed with HIV during the study. So not exactly at the moment that they got HIV, because we're not there in these trials in the bedroom with, a, with, with any of but the, at the time they found out they had HIV, only 8%. So men who got HIV, the men who got HIV and IPREX weren't necessarily taking it. And this is important for thinking about PrEP too. Interestingly, only 54% of the men who didn't get HIV during the study were taking it. It was not easy for all the men in IPREX to take this pill every day. And when we think about how to make PrEP available, one of the things is how to make it easier to take or to be taken in, the, in a way that's going to protect. They did some calculations and said, if you had drug in your body, PrEP might be as high as 92% protective. So that's pretty striking. I just want to talk about one other thing that's related to PrEP. There's another trial of PrEP called Caprice 004, which was a gel used by women to protect them, an intravaginal gel used by women to protect them against HIV. It contained tenofovir. This is not, we have very, we have very few women here in our crowd today, but this was a trial that was done in South Africa. It used the gel with sex, and it also showed a reduction in HIV risk, a 39% reduction in HIV risk for women in South Africa who used a tenofovir gel as PrEP. So there's accumulating evidence that this could work. There are four trials that are still ongoing of PrEP, really important, and they're in different populations, in injection drug users in Thailand, in HIV discordant couples is a trial that I run in East Africa, and then in women in South Africa, uh, Uganda, and Zimbabwe, using either oral PrEP or a vaginal gel. The third one down there called FemPrep was just stopped last week because it didn't work. In a population of very high-risk women from several African countries, PrEP did not provide protection against HIV for reasons we don't know right now. May have been they weren't taking it, may have been they may not work in this population, may have been their risk was too high. 
we'll know more probably in a year as those data are analyzed more. There are a lot of questions about PrEP for people who work on this a lot. And the one question is, this is a quote from the advocate that I've carried around for a long time, will, and makes me think, will changing risk behavior undermine all the protection from PrEP? Will guys or girls have more sex or more unsafe sex because they think they're fully protected when PrEP only reduces risk? I'm not against sex, by the way. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Although I'm selective. Um, the, there, there, are, um, there are lots of questions that I think about because I get asked a lot, well, how would you make PrEP available? And there's, aren't, there's, there are unending questions how to make PrEP available. But who would you target? Uh, and I think a lot about women in high-risk settings. I think about men who are, who are married to women in high-risk settings, I work, where I work in East Africa. Men who have sex with men, gay and bisexual men, and transgender women in high, in, who are at risk in, for whatever reasons, or men or couples, either uh, gay couples or heterosexual couples, where one has HIV and the other one doesn't. That's hard to use condoms forever. How to, how to ensure real access so that people can get this and coverage because if just one or two people take it, it doesn't change the epidemic. And so how to really make a huge difference, where to deliver it, in HIV clinics, people want to go to an HIV clinic to pick up HIV medicine to, to keep themselves HIV negative, to primary care clinics, to pharmacies, to STD clinics. How to make sure it stays safe, the data that we have suggest it's safe, and we give this to hundreds of thousands of people with, with HIV as treatment, and we know it has very high safety from that, but how do we make sure that, it's, that people who are negative and don't have a disease stay safe when taking a medicine? And how to get high adherence and how to pay. There's no answer on how to, I have no answer to all of these, but they're really important questions to talk about. I want to end with a couple slides. Are we ready to give PrEP to men in the US? The US CDC has released what's called interim guidance. This is ahead of government speak for Guidance precedes guidelines in government speak, but so interim guidance is guidance for doctors and other prescribers to be able to prescribe PrEP to men in the US to prevent HIV. So there are ways to think about doing this that are being released by real official agencies. And so are we ready to try this? And then someday might we have something better, a gel for, including for anal sex, or a better things for women or an injectable that maybe people wouldn't have to think about taking a pill every day but getting just a shot every month. So I'm gonna end with just a parting thought that you can read and I'm excited for the conversation. Thanks everybody. Thanks for having me. Thanks Fred for bringing me here to beautiful Seattle. Um, as you see, I'm going to talk about magic pills and potions. I'm not going to talk so much about potions, but being the head of IRMA, the International Rectal Microbicide Advocates, it's something I talk about a lot. I think there's a lot of future in developing a gel, a lubricant, a douche, or an enema that could have anti-HIV qualities, whether that's an ARV drug in those things or something else. And in fact, uh, Jared talked about tenofovir gel being tested vaginally that a version of that tenofovir gel that has been tested vaginally is now being tested, or has been tested um, up 60 people's butts in the US. And depending on how well that goes, um, there'll be a larger trial, including butts from around the world, um, starting next year. So I would love, since you've kind of broken your dry spell on, on uh, forums, I would love to come back and talk about the potion part of this. So I'm gonna talk more, more about pills. So first, <laughs> I used to, when this show was on, when I was a young, young child, I did believe in magic. I wished I was her, or Pauline, or Jeannie. I really believed in Almighty oh, Isis. I tried to fly off the little hill inside my house. I did believe in magic. But there is a reality about the US epidemic, and it isn't such a pretty reality. We're at our 30th uh, anniversary. More than 56,000 infections every year over a million people living with HIV in this country. Up to half have irregular access to care, care and treatment. About a, a fifth don't know their status. And the highest rates, as you can see there, 
are among gay and bi men. They're really insanely high rates. And we are the, actually the only group where the rates continue to climb. Uh, among some groups of gay men, our rates are sub-Saharan in severity. In some places in this country, one in two black gay men are likely to be positive. One in two. There's nowhere else in the world that has rates like that. It's insane. Um, and there's also, it's not just about gay men and gay men of color. There are pockets of African-American women who are highly impacted and also transgender women. So why? We have all of this great stuff. We have male and female condoms. We have behavior change. We have voluntary counseling and testing, 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 testing. We have te STD testing and treatment. We know if we get our STDs tested and treated, um, much less likely to, uh, to spread HIV. Uh, we have treatment. We have better treatment. And more people on treatment, better treatment, means less viral load, means less likely to pass on HIV. We also have all this stuff, education. For people who use injection drugs, we have clean syringe exchange programs. We have PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, which Jared talked about. Um, so we have all these really, really great things. So why are we in this place? Why do we need other tools? Why can't this toolbox just do it for us? No hocus pocus there. And you know, we've spent a lot of time working to make safe sex sexier and hotter and condoms hot and sexy. And um, you know, I think we've done a pretty good job. We've been doing it for 30 years. Um, but we've hit a place where we're just not getting over the edge anymore. We've kind of plateaued. Um, after the advent of antiretroviral therapies, when those drugs came online in the, in the middle 90s, um, there was less concern about HIV, for good reason, because we had really good drugs to start treating it. And so we started to see condom use decrease a little bit. And it's remained at this place where about half of gay men are using condoms regularly, the other half aren't. And you know, I'll just want to put this stuff out there. Have we focused on the other stuff that's not about navel to knee, and condoms, and STDs, and testing, and pins, and, pick, and pricks, and all of that stuff? Um, human rights, LGBT rights, all the phobias and the isms, how do those contribute to HIV? What about bullying? We've been talking a lot about bullying lately in terms of LGBT suicide and risk of suicidal ideation and depression. But what's the connection between bullying and later HIV risk? How much have we ta talked about that? How much have we talked about the economy being a big issue in terms of whether people can take care of themselves or not and prevent HIV infection? Uh, all kinds of other structural issues. I don't think we've talked about a lot of this stuff. We haven't focused enough holistically. We've really focused our work, navel to knee, as if, in, as if gay men's health only matters what happens in this area. And the area is important. I get, you know, it's important for all of us, but there's all this other stuff up here that could be addressed better and could also be an HIV prevention intervention in and of itself. And have we talked about sexual health and wellness? How often do we talk about sexual health and don't immediately go to disease? There's a definition of sexual health that doesn't include disease. And it doesn't have to be just about disease. And so I think we've not focused enough on these things. And resilience. How often do we talk about the strengths in our community and the assets that we have brought to bear to develop everything that we have today in terms of fighting HIV and all the ways that we survive and really sometimes harsh situations that we rise above, survive, do it fabulously, limp-sticking our way through it all. But you know, we have done some good stuff. So, and we've done really good, I think, our, our strategies around really trying to get people tested and improving testing has had some impact. 80% know their status, as I mentioned before. The condom thing, Still, we're about 50%. So when we talk about people changing their risk behaviors, there are already people who have changed their risk behavior. So 44% efficacy is better than zero. If you're not using condoms, you have zero efficacy in terms of your prevention tool. You're not using anything. So 44 goes from zero to 44%. So I look at it as plus plus. All those things that I talked about, all the things in the current toolbox, testing and treatment and condoms, we need all those things. We're going to need to continue to use those things. If people are using condoms uh, in a 
consistent, correct way, they like them, keep using them. Some of these tools will be filling in the gaps for people who can't use them, don't want to use them, for whatever reason can't spend their entire lives use, using them every single time and need options. So there's this plus plus. Vaccines are a plus plus, microbicides. Uh, Jared talked about the Caprisa trial that showed a vaginal gel could work. I told you that rectal gels are in development. We're gonna have much bigger studies reporting out on whether um, to kind of confirm those Caprisa results. We'll be seeing those results in the next couple years. We have IPREX results, but we also have these FemPrep. That was this trial that Jared mentioned that closed due to futility. They didn't prove that it couldn't work in women, but they, their trial couldn't prove that it worked. The trial couldn't show any impact, and we're not sure why that is. Maybe it is something about it doesn't work in women. Maybe it's about the route of transmission. It doesn't work when you take orally for vaginally transmitted HIV or vaginal acquisition of HIV. We don't know, but we have to look into that. And then, of course, expanded treatment. None of that is hocus pocus. It's all just stuff we need to do, and we need to continue to work on this stuff. Equally what's not hocus pocus, everyone remembers driver's ed. I wish it was, I wish I was magical during that time. I failed behind the wheel four times. I have to go back to the, my high school every time and say I didn't get my license because I failed. I would have loved to just like wiggle my nose and got my license. I got it on the fifth try. Again, no hocus pocus. I think the woman was just feeling really bad for me. <laughs> but we have all kinds of ways to make safe driving safer. So you go to driver education and you have to go behind the wheel and prove you know how to drive in parallel park and all that. You have seat belts, you have airbags, you have bumpers that you can decorate beautifully like this one. You have stoplights and stop signs and all kinds of things like that. You have rules, rules that are evolving as we evolve so now you can't talk on your cell phone while you're driving. And we have guardrails on the highway. So we have all of these things that are meant to keep us safe because driving is really unsafe. And in fact, in 2009, with all those things, and that's just the tip, right? There's a lot more. We still had almost 31,000 deaths due to driving a car. The only way to drive a car safely is to be abstinent. It's the only way. <laughs> Otherwise, it's terribly unsafe. I didn't pull up data because I'm not a car data kind of guy, but I didn't pull up data about how many fender benders, how many people um, had their arm chopped off by a car door or something. These are just deaths, just. So all of those things put together, we still had a lot of harm. But if we didn't have those things, what would we have? If we didn't have bumpers or we didn't have airbags, how many more deaths would have been in that line? So thinking again about the plus plus, let's just say, you know what? Vaccines, uh -uh. we've been working on this forever. It ain't going to happen. It's too hard. We'll never get it. It's 30 years, blah, blah, blah. We can't do it. Cross vaccines are off the list. Microbicides, you know, we have 39% of efficacy. That's not very great. Who really cares? No one's going to want to use this. It's too complicated. It's too expensive. Wipe it off the list. Prep, same thing. Talk about expensive. And taking a pill every day, who the hell wants to take a pill every day that costs that kind of money? Take it off. And you know, treatment. Treatment, I mean, in the early days, some of us who were around in the 80s, AZT was really, really nasty. Nasty, nasty, nasty. We should have just stopped them because it was so nasty, all treatment therefore was nasty. So just get rid of all this. What would happen if the plus plus for all of that went away? How many infections would we not avert if we didn't try these tools, if we didn't try to move forward and add things to our toolbox? So there's a lot of challenges. And we started to bring those up in some of this discussion around PrEP. And I'm going to lay them out there really clearly. Uh, cost, access, who, how do we make sure that people who need it get it? How will people be adherent to it? Acceptability means, will people like it? You have to like it. You have to want to do it. It has to be part of your routine. It can't be something that you don't want to do. It won't work then. There's cost again. I have cost in there a couple of times because cost is a big issue. Um, Will there be behavioral disinhibition? We don't know. The trials show us that there hasn't been, but those have been in very contained clinical trials where people are getting this whole suite of stuff. 
in the real world, will behavior change? We don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. We have to find that out. We have to do some demonstration projects, really, to figure that out. And what about long term? We didn't see toxicities, really, um, in the short term in these trials, or resistance. It wasn't enough time. But over time, if someone's taking PrEP for several years, will they see resistance down the line or toxicities down the line? And this is the big thing, I think, that I'm really concerned about, is how do we get it to the most vulnerable people, the people who need it the most, people who are most at risk, most likely to use it, and, and, and have it have an impact, right? So serial discordant couples, I can see that being a really important group. Young gay bi men of color, especially, where there's really high rates of HIV. People in really high prevalence settings, so African American women, in areas where the prevalence is really, really high, we know where they are. So would we, how do we make sure, though, that often these really vulnerable people get it and have access to it for as long as they need it? So there are a lot of things we're doing to get busy. We, the royal we, like advocates and scientists. Um, IPREX that uh, Jared talked about has now, there's an open label extension called IPREX Olay. It's a great acronym. So they're extending for another 72 weeks or something. All the trial sites are going to continue in an open label fashion. People in the trial will have a choice of whether they want to take the pill or not. They can stay part of the trial and get all the other services and not take the pill. They're going to be collecting more data. Um, there needs to be some data on that fem prep. Like, what exactly happened? Why did that go south? Why didn't it work? Or why didn't the trial show it worked? Is this a problem among women? Or was it a, a, an answer that the trial was not able to answer correctly? There's other trials underway. Jared talked about that. We're going to need a lot more science, more science, more science. We're going to need demonstration projects to show how this could work, how it could roll out and follow people to see how they really use it in the real world, how adherence change, all of those things. We, we're going to need to have projects funded to do that. Uh, and we're going to also need other agents. It's not just about Truvada or any one drug. We're going to need a number of agents. We're going to need a number of product options. And when I mean product options, that's also microbicides. So PrEP can be topical as a lubricant or a douche or a vaginal gel or ring, or it can be oral taken uh, as a pill. We're going to need a number of different things. And we can't get stuck on tenofovir and Truvada. There's actually a lot of other drugs that are being looked at. And I'm also highly advocating for things that are non-ARV based. Because I think people with HIV, like me, should be able to use a microbicide that uh, doesn't have uh, an antiretroviral in it. Because that could be suboptimal therapy for me, right? If I'm taking a, uh, one drug up my butt, but I'm supposed to be taking three drugs for my HIV, not a good thing. So we really need a whole mix of stuff. And what's happening now with Gilead, who owns uh, Truvada, is they're going for a new indication. So right now, their drug, Truvada, is indicated for treatment and stop. You can prescribe off-label, and doctors are prescribing off-label for prevention, but it is indicated for treatment. Uh, why do we need a new indication? Because it'll be better. Uh, doctors will find it more acceptable to use. There'll be less concerns about liability. There's patient acceptability. Patients will be more confident using something that has been indicated for prevention, not just given off-label. I think it facilitates access that way. And there's a really important part about how it gets paid for. So um, there's a concern that things won't get covered necessarily. Um, if there, it'll be harder to get like uh, government programs to cover something that is not indicated. So third party, third party payer coverage is really, really important. And you know, um, just to be keeping it real, uh, getting an indication from the FDA means that the, the drug maker can market it. So they can put lots of ads up to say, Truvada for prevention. Um, and so they'll be able, they will have a market. They will make some money, for sure, in this country. Um, this is the country where drug makers make their money. They don't make it in other countries, really. Um, they make it all on our backs. Uh, but so that's the, the suite of reasons why I think uh, Gilead is going for uh, indication and why an indication is important. So in my, in my uh, estimation, the FDA should be listening to good quality data, looking for good quality data, getting experts. This is the first time we've ever been confronted with something like this. So it's kind of, we're breaking new ground. Um, and they need to just base their decisions on whether this indication happens on science. The science straight up. There's no politicization, no stigmatization, and they need to fulfill their mandate. 
It is not their mandate to think about how it will be used in the real world or how people, how much it will cost. It's like, is this uh, something that we can indicate for prevention? The real world takes care of it from there. So I'm wrapping up. Uh, other part of getting busy that we have to think about, prep has costs that are beyond the pill. Um, so I say here, you know, it's not cheap. Uh, Truvada is about ten dollars to $14,000 list price. The ADAP price, the AIDS Drug Assistance Program price, is about half that. Um, don't exactly know, but it's definitely not the list price. Um, this is still really expensive. How are we going to fix this? And then there's other costs. Doctor visits, HIV testing, ongoing connection to care costs money. All those things cost. Um, and as I note here, Truvada just went up. Uh, Gilead just raised the price of their drug in general. Um, it's not affecting ADAP as far as I understand, but that hurts all of us, really. Um, so we're going to need to talk about how we get this drug uh, down to a price that third parties will pay for, insurance will pay for. Insurance, by the way, is already, is there, our insurance companies are already covering PrEP. Kaiser Permanente is one of them. So finally, so what do communities say? That stuff like this is where we really need to be connecting with communities. It's really your decision whether PrEP rolls out in your community or not. It's your intervention. Do you want it or don't you? And how will you, how will it work or how won't it? In the meantime, how can we improve delivery of what we already have? We have things that we're not doing the best job on. Let's, how do we do better? How do we find those people who we, who are those pockets of people who aren't tested, who don't know their status? How do we get more people into care? How do we get rid of AIDS drug waiting lists? How can we do those things better? How can we get PEP to people? Much, many places in the country, no one knows about PEP or doesn't know how to get it. Or you find that you do something, you know, you have a wild night on Friday and you have to wait until Monday and your window of opportunity has significantly closed because you've had to wait to go get your PEP. I mentioned demonstration projects, it bears repeating. We need to do projects to start answering these questions because a clinical trial will never answer all of them for us. Have to figure out the cost issue, say it again and again. We can't back away from it, but it's doable. I think it's doable. And at the end of the day, how do we leverage the optimism that we have these trials now that are showing us it's a revolutionary time. It's a confusing time, but we've found in the last year two things that could change the trajectory of HIV. A gel used in the vagina so far and a pill for gay men. I mean, there's more things to come. We're in a really exciting time. We're also in a time, I liken it to, you know, some of you maybe weren't around, some of you were, when we had boom boxes and eight-track tape players. Um, that's our first prep and our first microbicide. They're going to be clunky. They're not going to be great. We're going to have to fix them. They're going to be iterated over time, and then we're going to have these hot, cute little iPods and iPads that, like, cook your dinner and connect you to the moon. <laughs> but we ain't there yet. Um, but nothing is impossible. And I think in something so important, we can't say it's impossible and throw up our hands. It's a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in the world. They've been given and get situated even in our kind of skepticism and cynicism um, than to explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact. It's an opinion. It's not a declaration. It's a dare. Impossible is potential. Impossible is temporary. And as Muhammad Ali says, it's nothing. Or Coldplay. And with Coldplay. No one said this was going to be easy. It hasn't been easy for 30 years. It's been damn hard. Every time we turn the corner, it gets harder, or it's a new kind of hard. No one ever said it was going to be this hard. But we have, we're up to the challenge. We've shown we've done some amazing things in our community to get us to where we are. We have another mountain to climb, and I think we can do it. Thank we are, you very where much. Where we stand right now. Any doctor, medical provider in the United States can prescribe PrEP to any patient. And we don't believe in interfering between a doctor and a patient. The question really is, uh, comes down to the question of whether or not there ought to be an FDA indication. And I couldn't disagree more with the previous speaker. Uh, Gilead uh, will make $2 billion a year this year on antiretrovirals. Uh, Bloomberg has estimated that they will, uh, if this is approved by the FDA, will earn an additional billion dollars. Okay. So I don't think it's necessary for our community to run any benefits uh, for them. 
The ability to advertise this, to promote it, uh, to give samples, uh, will be, in my opinion, a runaway train. We're one of the few societies that allows the advertising of pharmaceuticals. This is something that happened during the Clinton administration. I think it's not a good thing. So I'd like to bring up, um, if I could, just, uh, I don't have a lot of slides, but just to give you some examples of the campaign that AIDS Healthcare Foundation has been waging across the country in ads throughout the gay press. Um, this first ad, No Magic Pill, um, basically lays out our simple position. Uh, the second one, uh, Gilead's Greedy Gamble, what they have to gain as a corporation from this. Um, uh, third one, Giving Up on Gay Men. Um, and the uh, fourth, hands off HIV prevention. You know, uh, when you talk about 44% efficacy, no, sorry, can everybody hear me already? No, no, okay, I'll talk. I know of no medication, no vaccine that has ever been approved with 44% efficacy. Um, in the follow-up to this study, six months later, the efficacy went down from 44% to 39%. As was stated earlier, half of the people in this study had no medication in their system at all. In this study, which has nothing to do with a real-world situation, these patients were seen every month by a doctor, every month by an adherence counselor, and they were tested for HIV and other STDs every month. You know, what would the adherence to this be if it were, if people were seen every three months or every six months? Beyond that, I have a very close friend who has fairly severe high blood pressure, and I'm always shocked when he tells me that he hasn't taken his medication, his high, blood pressure is running high because he hasn't taken his medication for a week. And also in our own practice of HIV, and we are the largest, not only in the United States, but in the world, is a very high rate of non-adherence. And my question is, you know, it seems to me that uh, you've got to be really paranoid about your pants falling down to wear belt and suspenders. Why would anyone take chemotherapy if they intended to use a condom? It just doesn't make sense. In addition, one thing that wasn't mentioned is that virtually all the participants in this study were paid to be in the study. Also, the study participants in the United States, as were mentioned, were only in San Francisco and Boston, and almost all of them were white, and almost all of them had some college education. So the basic question is, what's the rush? Gilead, there's been one study in gay and bisexual men. One. Okay. And Gilead intends to file an application with the FDA before the end of June. There have been no real world studies. Um, you know, when they asked the patients in this study, they said, are you taking your medication? They said, yes. Okay. So they drew their blood, and they found that half of them were not. Okay. You know, I saw a thing on TV where they asked people about their dietary habits, and then they fished the haagen containers out of the garbage, OK? Um, you know, for those of you who have been tested for HIV and they asked you how many sexual partners did you have, were you completely honest? Um, so why it is in this study that we believe the people when they say that they continue to use condoms and we believe them that they reduced the number of sexual partners when we know that they lied about taking the drug? So uh, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, I really want to disagree strongly with the notion that HIV prevention in the gay community is failing, or has failed. Okay, 
we have about 600,000 gay men who are HIV positive. And from that group, we have approximately 28,000 new infections on a yearly basis. It's too many, way, way too many. But um, it is not the case that the vast majority of gay men are routinely putting themselves at the highest risk. If they were, we'd have many more new infections. We'd have the kind of infection rates we had in earlier years, which we do not have now. And I also contest the fact that we are doing as much as we could do on HIV prevention. The CDC still has a rule that you can't promote homosexuality in HIV prevention. You know, we, um, you can't advertise condoms on television in this country. You, um, you know, our gay and lesbian leadership, political, entertainment, otherwise, never talks about it. It's treated like a dirty secret. So I think there's a whole lot more we can do. And the reality is, is whether it's the African American community, the gay community, the uh, Latino community, it's only going to work if it's owned by us, not by a, a government agency. We have to take it back. Um, if we had a Norplant, I don't know if people know what Norplant was, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a contraceptive that's implanted under the skin and, and, it, and it emits drug on a routine basis, regular basis. If we had something like that, I would be the first person to applaud and say, great. If we can have a time release thing that's not dependent on people taking it every day, fantastic. So I'm for more experimentation, but Truvada as PrEP as a public health strategy is a potential catastrophe. And I'm not the only person who thinks that. Last week, the American Public Health Association said, in the case of PrEP, clinical trials may demonstrate physiological efficacy, but are unlikely to provide definitive information on adherence levels and risk compensation, key parameters in determining whether PrEP will lead to increased rather than decreased HIV transmission. Um, we're talking about giving a serious medication to people in their 20s that affects bone density and kidney function. It's necessary to do that for a person who's positive because uh, the virus is worse. But the idea that we are going to medicalize the entire gay community, to me, is outrageous. Um, and um, we should not just skip over the fact that a trial, a large trial in women, failed. So now we have one large trial in men that succeeded and one large trial in women that failed. That screams out for more studies, not less and not a rush to judgment. Um, so just a little bit on the cost. I mean, I agree with Jim Pickett to say that the FDA shouldn't decide on the basis of cost. It should decide on the basis of the public health impact. That I disagree. But on the basis of cost, that's not their job. But to say a little bit about cost. If Truvada is a billion dollar seller for prevention. It will be more than the entire HIV prevention budget of the Centers for Disease Control in the United States. Second of all, each infection averted will cost $345,000. Third is, why is it necessary for Gilead, which is gonna make $2 billion off of AIDS drugs this year, to charge the same amount for it for prevention as it does for treatment, since they've already made back all of their research and development costs. Um, we have 8,000 people on a waiting list for AIDS drugs in the United States today. Um, there's no way that Medicaid and ADAP uh, are going to pay for this. But the thing I'll end on to say is that I am old enough to remember when people took 
and I'm sure there are others in the audience who are as well, when we popped penicillin before a night on the town. That didn't end so well. So I think my, my basic message here is we've got to take this back. Take it back from the drug companies, take it back from the CDC, from the academics, and decide what we, as a community, we as gay men, need. Thank you. And now that we've heard different sides of this issue, we'd like to include some local community voices to round out our discussion this evening. As we open our uh, open forum discussion, we will introduce you to four additional panelists that will be helping us with the discussion, including Austin Anderson, who works as a project coordinator for the African American Testing and Brothers Link programs at the Center for Multicultural uh, Health in Seattle. He has worked in HIV prevention and education for over six years. Austin? And I'm going to stand back here so you guys can uh, look at our celebrities. Uh, next panelist is the, uh, the, uh, Dr. Daniel Augenstein, and he is a pharmacist whose primary expertise is in the care of individuals living with HIV AIDS and the co-owner of Seattle Meds Pharmacy, the only independent pharmacy in Seattle dedicated to LGBT health. Dr. Augenstein completed his pharmacy degree at Creighton University and a research fellowship in health economics at the University of Washington. He has worked in pharmacy on Capitol Hill and First Hill for the last 15 years in Seattle. He was recently credentialed by the American Academy of HIV Medicine. Dr. Augenstein also serves on the steering committee of the Washington HIV Early Intervention Program. He previously served with Medical Teams International, where he was part of a delegation to Beijing PRC of People's Republic of China as a guest of the Ministry of Health and China Center for Disease Control. Dr. Augenstein also served on the Seattle Commission for Sexual Minorities. Once again, Dr. Dan Augenstein. Also joining us this evening is Nick Litursky. He is a 44-year-old Seattle native, a former test subject with the HIV Vaccine Trials Unit, and a regular participant in the annual Seattle AIDS Walk. While Nick is HIV negative, his partner Ciro converted two and a half years ago. In consultation with his personal physician, Nick began using PrEP five months ago, shortly after study results were released in the New England Journal of Medicine. Nick, welcome. And lastly, Mr. Fred Swanson. He celebrates his 10th year as the executive director of Gay Silly Health Project this year which is not nearly as exciting to his five-year-old as his affinity for Transformers. His work on HIV and gay men's health and wellness started in Berlin and moved him to Chicago before landing him in Seattle. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Fred Swanson. We would like to ask each of you to speak um, briefly about, uh, give us your remarks, your impressions of of what this all means uh, for our community here locally. Fred, I guess you get to start. You've got the talking stick. Yeah, I guess I get to start. Well, I, I mean, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time, you know, with me talking, because it's really about you all. Um, I, you know, I mean, I think that our panelists laid it out really clearly. There's a lot of questions, there's a lot of concerns, and there's a lot of excitement. Um, I think for Gay City, uh, you know, we're really excited about the idea that there's something else, something else to look at, something else to ask questions about, something else for the community to talk about in terms of HIV prevention. I mean, when's the last time we had over 100 guys in a room talking about HIV prevention? It's been a while. And I think uh, that's exciting. So I mean, I think there's a lot to talk about. Um, and there are a lot of questions about PrEP. Uh, so I mean, I think that's been laid out well. I'm glad that we're here. And I hope that as we move forward and look into those questions and that part of what we can do is help determine what the research agenda looks like. What are the questions we want to have answered before we decide whether or not PrEP is good for a widespread audience? What are the questions, the research questions that we want the FDA to ask before deciding whether or not to, uh, the, to change the usage, uh, the label of uh, Truvada or any other HIV med for HIV prevention. So I mean, I think there's, there's. I mean, I'm just excited that there are people here to talk about it, 
And, uh, and that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, <clears throat> As, as the introduction said, uh, you know, I was with my partner prior to him serial converting, and we always maintained a regimen of testing on a regular basis. Uh, we found out about two and a half years ago that he had serial converted. Uh, unfortunately, we found out uh, that the previous six-month test uh, had reported to him incorrectly. So it turned out we had been having uh, plenty of an active sex life for six months without protection uh, when he was positive. Uh, when we found that out, of course, that had its impact, and he's had some health difficulties from that. Uh, frankly, he was absolutely terrified uh, of hurting me. And uh, regardless of him being medicated and having an undetectable viral load, regardless of any other protection measures, uh, he was frankly terrified to basically even touch me. Uh, when this became available, our physician, we both go to the same doctor, uh, sat us down and said, look, here's an option. And after discussing this thoroughly with him and researching it on my own, I felt this is an appropriate step to take. Uh, frankly, it saved the relationship. You know, I, I suppose in some perfect world we wouldn't care about sex, but uh, you know that that is a part of every relationship, and it's an important part. And you know, it, it's it's been a, it's had a tremendously positive impact on our relationship. I have not had side effects. I am fortunate to have good insurance that does cover it. Uh, you know, I just I really haven't seen a lot of these uh, supposed negatives come out of it in my experience. Um, I've been a pharmacist in Seattle and uh, for quite a number of years helping people live with uh, with HIV. And the one thing that you know, and, and I will say that I'm really glad that. PrEP, including medications, and we have to remember that uh, PrEP includes a lot of prevention activities uh, other than the medications. Uh, I'm really excited that this is an, this is an option for us and, and, it's, and that we're having this kind of discussion. But uh, it really surprises me that after spending 15 years coaching people on how to take their medications and keep taking their medications, believe me, it is difficult to take these things. Um, some people have different experiences with side effects than others, and you know, HIV therapy itself is highly individualized. It's not one pill or one size fits all. We have to choose the right regimen for the right patient. So I hope that our discussion moves from just Truvada and into other regimens as well if, if medications are going to remain part of PrEP as a tool in our tool chest to prevent HIV. Um, we have to remember that in taking any drug whatsoever, be it Tylenol or Truvada or anything else, you're trading one set of problems for another set of problems. And so hopefully the set of problems that you're going to take are going to be better than the set of problems that you're going to give up by taking the drug. And so sessions like this will help us decide what these things are that we're talking about, what are the problems that we're that we're going to take on by taking this drug, and we know what the problems are that we hopefully will be giving up, and that's living with HIV for the rest of your life. Hi, everybody. Um, as I agreed to be a part of this panel, um, I, and since we've gone through the process and I've learned more, I will say that I've definitely stayed very much on the fence with this about which way to go and wanting to learn more information. And I did that wearing the hat of someone from my community. And as I've done this work over the past few years, my clients have consistently been black and Latino gay men who were from lower income areas or considered to be living in poverty. And so I've always thought about this from that standpoint. And so as we have this discussion, that tends to be where my mind goes is, how would one of my clients look at this? How would this affect one of my clients? As Jim said, the folks who are more affected by this virus and this epidemic. That's where my mind tends to go. And as my mind goes there, I appreciate more facts than sound bites that are used to just create a frenzy. And I feel that in our community, that's what we could use more of the facts versus sound bites used to create a frenzy 
just to get us going in a direction which may not be the direction we need to go. And so really thinking about it critically, and as Jim said, I loved looking at the science. Wonderful. Once again, Fred, Nick, Darren, and Austin. And Austin, I'm on the fence too. I gotta worry about what purse matches that magic pill. We really wanna encourage everyone, and we, uh, on behalf of Gay City, to talk to our panelists, talk amongst yourselves, and continue these discussions. It doesn't end here tonight, but hopefully you do go home, you leave this uh, space tonight knowing more, and that you do make informed choices. In the leather community, uh, and those of us who play with BDSM, we have something called RAC, Risk Aware Consensual Kink, and it's forums like this and getting all of the information that you possibly can to make an informed decision um, is the best way to go about making your decision. And we would like to thank our panelists and our guests um, for helping educate us and provide us with the information to make the decisions we're going to be making in the future. And I would also like to thank my beautiful co-host. Thank you, Tony. And once again, Mr. Tony Buff. And once again, Mr. Michael Weinstein, Jim Pickett, Dr. Jared Baton, Fred Swanson, Nick Litursky, Dr. Dan Augenstein, and Austin from CMCH. And, and of on, course, and you, 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 and you. And on behalf of Gay City Health Project, thank each and every one of you for coming out this evening. Thank you very much. You once again, good night, everyone, and thank you.